Hi, good morning everybody. So, today we're going to discuss uh, about data domain wafer tomography using correlation. I will show you some of the motivation uh, based on some of the shortcomings that arise from the use of global correlations. To introduce you to this problem that we will discuss in this presentation, let me show you this gradient. You don't need to know much about this particular gradient, but what what you uh, can realize is that it contains a, a lot of events. And these events here arise from the crosstalk between seismic events uh, during a global correlation process and therefore is propagated into the gradient. So producing this sort of a high wave number reflector-like events. Instead, if we use local correlations, we are able to capture uh, the correct uh, information from the seismic events because we will compare a, a seismic event from the model data with the corresponding event in observed data. And, well, the work uh, of tomography using correlations is in the line of a, a minimization functions based on penalization of energy outside local correlation. Energy outside correlation, sorry. So, well, let's discuss about the operators that we use for these tomographic problems. So let's start first by the global correlation. As you can see in the global correlation, we basically shift uh, two signals that we want to compare, F G, in this case, is defined as a center correlation. And then we stack over all possible times. We integrate over all possible times. So this can produce a high correlation between events that are quite away from each other during in the seismic signal. Uh, from now on, this, uh, in this formula, correlation formula, is a linear operator. So we will use capital C as operator throughout this presentation. Instead, we could use the local correlation proposed by Dave a few years ago, where we not only compute the product between two shifted signals, but instead of uh, stacking over all possible times, we do it uh, with this window function. The window function is a Gaussian window, and it has some exponential damping proportional to the time lag. The nice thing about this implementation is that the convolution with this Gaussian window is recursive and is quite efficient, almost at the same cost of a global correlation. And it actually contains uh, more information because tell us about uh, local information along the correlation between signals A and B. So the, the local correlation is also a linear operator and from now on we will use the same capital C. So as you can see, uh, if we let the window go to infinity, then the global correlation converges to a the local correlation converges to a global correlation, which will become time invariant. So the local correlation uh, consists of two steps. First, we apply a shifting operator that basically computes the product between a shifted versions of F and G, and then we apply a convolution operator with the Gaussian window. So this Gaussian window is SPD, so when we compute the adjoint operator, which will become a local convolution operator, we first apply the Gaussian uh, convolution operator followed by the transpose of the shifting oper operator. So once we have this uh, forward and adjoint pair, Define, uh, we will use it further for the tomographic problem. So let me show you a little bit the value of this local correlation. Let me illustrate first with a, a very simple synthetic example. This signal, F of t, contains three events, and we want to compare it with this other signal, G of t. As you can see, there are some non-constant shifts uh, between these two signals. If we compute a local correlation, as you can see, it's local because we have the time axis uh, going from left to right, and we have the correlation lag axis in the vertical direction. So as you can see, the local correlation captures 
uh, the travel time misfits between each, each pair of event in these two signals. In this case, I use a correlation window of 40 milliseconds. Instead, if we use a global correlation, as you can see, it's time invariant. Uh, we can also see the kinematic information from the correlation of these three events, but also we see a lot of other events. So this correlation function uh, becomes more complex and it's harder to interpret. So in this case, we apply this global correlation by letting sigma go to infinity. So what about the, what, what can we recover from these correlation operators? So here you can see uh, the recover F from the correlation by the application of the adjoint for the case of the global correlation. As you can observe, the, this uh, recover function contains three events that are in agreement kinematically with the original events. However, they are very complex because they also contain information from the cross-talking events present in the correlation. Instead, if we uh, recover the signal F through the application of the join operator using local correlations, uh, you can see that the retrieve signal is simpler than that of the global correlation. This is because uh, to retrieve, in order to retrieve this signal, uh, we didn't observe any cross-talking event during the correlation. So we can actually go a little bit further in the trying to recover a better signal for the inversion by replacing the joint operator through inversion. So instead of recovering the, the original signal F through the application of the joint, we can set up an inverse problem to find a, a filter C such that the recover signal uh, matches as, as best as possible the original signal F. So in this case, you can think about little c as a time variant match filter. And to stabilize the inversion process, we can add a damping term that uh, basically tries to keep the filter, the retrieve filter, as small as possible. So again, this is the local correlation, and this is the retrieve inverse filter. As you can see, the, the retrieve uh, events in this local correlation are spiky, as we expect, because it was obtained through this uh, de local deconvolution operation. We can also retrieve this uh, match filter uh, using a global correlation by letting sigma go to infinity. And as you can see again, the, this, this retrieve filter is very complex, probably more complex than the original correlation filter. So it's hard to extract kinematic information from it. And however, both of them can produce a, a, a signal, a recovered signal that uh, best resembles the original signal F. So to illustrate that, uh, this is the original signal F, and this is the application of the adjoint. So as you can see, there are some uh, uh, amplitude uh, differences between them. However, kinematically, the three events are in, at the right place. And this is the retrieve uh, signal through the application of the inverse filter for the local correlation. And this is for global correlation. So both of them uh, produce a good recovery of the original signal. However, the one obtained through local correlation is much simpler and easier to interpret. So how can we use this uh, local correlation operator in a tomographic context? Well, first of all, we can define an objective function. In this case, uh, it's very similar to what we do in the image domain. So in the image domain, we try to uh, remove energy outside zero lag. Here, we can do the same in the data domain. So by minimizing the penalized correlation. So this penalty matrix P uh, basically enhances energy outside zero lag, enhances what we want to uh, remove from this correlation, what we want to bring to zero lag. 
So in this tomographic context, dm is the model data, and c is this correlation matrix that contains the observed data embedded on it. So as I showed you at the beginning, it consists of this shifting operator and the Gaussian window uh, uh, convolution matrix. So this penalization matrix, uh, we could use uh, absolute value of tau, for instance, to penalize energy outside zero lag. However, uh, this function uh, will produce a zero residual if our uh, model data and correlation and, and, and observed data match exactly at zero lag if and only if the, the bandwidth of our data is infinity. So, so that doesn't happen. So instead, we can try to, to mimic a, a band-limited penalty function, which uh, you can recall from previous presentations in last year's, for instance, from Tony and Jan, that he, he did something similar in the image domain. So in order to recover the band-limited nature of uh, our data, we could use a penalty function that uh, takes into account the bandwidth through uh, an application of, for instance, the envelope of the autocorrelation of the source signal. And we can add a stabilization parameter. By doing that, uh, this penalty function goes to zero in the vicinity of tau, or goes almost to zero in the vicinity of tau equals zero, instead of going sharply. So this helps to reduce the large residuals, even though uh, we could be closer to the true answer. So by applying this band-limited penalty function, now we take into account the, the nature of our seismic uh, wavelet. So how can we calculate the gradient for this objective function? Well, first of all, we define, as, as John showed yesterday, uh, an augmented functional that consists in our original objective function j of m and the, the PDE constraint term that basically says that our wave field should satisfy the wave equation given our source wavelet s. So through this process we need to find the Lagrange multiplier as that, uh, that honors these PDE constraints. So to do so we first uh, compute the state variables and to do that, we, we want to find the perturbation of this uh, Lagrange multiplier in our objective function. Um, and uh, by doing so, we obtain the state equation. So basically, the first step we solve for US. And once we solve for US, uh, we can find the perturbation with respect to our state variable instead. And hence, we can find the Lagrange a multiplier that satisfies this equality constraint. GS is the adjoint source, and for this particular problem, it's given by uh, this formula here. Finally, to compute the gradient, uh, we compute the, the partial derivative of this uh, augmented functional with respect to our model parameters. And we arrive to the gradient formula for, in this case, for the acoustic isotropic uh, wave equation. We simply correlate the source wave field and a joint wave field, and the, the state wave field has a double time derivative that, uh, may, that can be split as well into to two time derivatives as we saw yesterday uh, in the tutorial. So now let's take a look about uh, some examples with this uh, local correlation objective function. So now you can better understand the gradients I showed you at the beginning. So in this experiment, we have one source, one receiver. The source is to your left, and the receiver is in the right. And we have a, a constant background with a, a slow uh, velocity anomaly, a Gaussian anomaly. Note that the, this Gaussian anomaly influences the path between source and receiver. So in this experiment, we have a free surface. So we don't expect a much a perturbation of the travel time along the free surface reflection. 
So the correct model is the constant background and the fast model contains a fast uh, Gaussian anomaly. So if we compare the three model uh, data for uh, these models, you can see that uh, we have a, f uh, a fairly apparent delay for the direct arrivals. However, for the uh, free surface arrival, they are almost no delayed. So let's take a look at some gradients. So this is the gradient from global correlation and by letting sigma go to infinity. So as you can see, as I showed you at the beginning, uh, this gradient contains uh, several events that we do not expect in this very simple experiment. And these event, events arise from the crosstalk present in the correlation function, the global correlation function, that is propagated through the joint source into the gradient. So if we go to the correct velocity, now you can see that the energy of this gradient uh, went down quite a bit. Well, her, and as we move to fast velocity, now we can see that the sign of the gradient changed. Uh, but however, we, we can still see a lot of these uh, cross-talking events. Instead, if we go to local correlations, uh, you can see how this uh, crosstalk between seismic events present in the global correlation is non-existent in, in the local correlation. So in this case, we use a, a Gaussian window of a sigma of 100 milliseconds and recovers uh, the path that we expect to update. So the source, direct source receiver path, the ellipse is an image of the free surface reflector, the the, in the gradient, and we also see the, the direct path to the free surface and, and going down into the receiver. So this is a gradient for correct velocity and for fast velocity. So as you can see, both uh, in either case, the gradient is much simpler and easier to interpret than that of the global correlation. So now let's compare some, uh, both of these gradients. So this is a gradient for fast uh, uh, velocity in global correlation, and this is a gradient for the local correlation. So as you can see, the gradient is simpler, and uh, the, the sign of the gradient uh, is preserved through these two Gaussian windows, however, the gradient is much simpler with local correlations. So now let's take a look at a very simple example using a crosswell transmission. So in this case, we have a setup of sources in the left side and a line of receiver in the right side. The, the model contains two Gaussian anomalies, one positive and one negative, and we start the inversion with a constant background. So this is the model retrieved through local correlation. Uh, for, for this model, the Gaussian window is 100 milliseconds. And this is a model retrieved to, through global correlation. So this model, you can see that it's contaminated by some events that we don't expect because for this uh, long window, uh, we have actually quite a bit of crosstalk in the correlation that is propagated into the gradient and is stuck through iterations into the retrieve model. So for this ex experiment, the, these are the convergence curves. So since the local correlations contain actually less events and correlate the, the corresponding event from observed data and model data, it's actually a simpler inversion problem than that of a global correlation. And hence, you can observe that the local correlation converges faster than that of the global correlation. So these are some examples of the model and the, mod the true data in the true model. So as you can see, the, the data due to the complexity of the anomaly uh, contains a, a big delay at the middle of the apex of the data that you can see in the initial model that the data is much simpler 
And through inversion, we recover the local correlation data and basically recovers most of the aspects of the, the true data. Instead, the, the global correlation data model in the, the retrieve model uh, doesn't match quite nicely this particular gather because it's influenced by all these events that propagate into the inverted model. Again, we can compare it with the observed data. And now, local correlation and observed data. So as you can see, the local correlation model retrieves the correct aspects of this data. So we can compare as well the correlations. Uh, this is the correla local correlation for a particular receiver in the initial model. So as you can see, there is a, a delay about 50 milliseconds in this model. So and this is the, the final correlation for this particular receiver in the final model. And this is the correlation from the, from the global inverted model. So now let's move on to an example, similar example, but using more complex model, Marmusi model. In this case, we wanted to see the, the capacity of the method to retrieve some of the, the features of this model so the high resolution features of the model. So our starting model is, quite, is, is a mildly smooth version of the initial model, and we want to see uh, how well this method does recovering this feature. Uh, for, for, for this particular model and experiment, the sources again are on the left, and the line of receivers is on the right. So for this inversion, uh, I use a window of 100 milliseconds, and if you compare with the global correlation, uh, there are some differences, especially during in the faulty areas, the fault areas, as highlighted by this ellipse. So for instance, this is local correlation, and this is global. And you can see as well here in the high velocity layer, this is local correlation, and this is global. So during this presentation, I have shown you uh, the application of local correlation in the context of tomography. Uh, our results show that we can see better event discrimination. And this, this comes because uh, local correlations are easier to interpret and give us an idea of the delays along the correlation signal, along the time axis. So basically, we are splitting what we see in a global correlation along the time axis. And this gives us the ability to better discriminate uh, travel time errors. And this, of course, is because we reduce the crosstalk. And as a byproduct of these simpler uh, correlation functions, we can see improved convergence in the inversion. Well, thank you very much for your attention. Happy to take questions.